Hey everybody, what's up? It's your boy MJ. Welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience Before the Poor, aka 20 Questions with MJ. My guest today is the first two time guest. I don't know if he's two time. And I'm thinking, two time? I'm a two time. I know. Does that really sound right? Sounds Um, good to me. uh, Well, you know, his stories were so good, so rich. We had to have him back because we got like maybe. 52% 52% there? I don't know. <laughs> and I'm sure he's got plenty more. <laughs> he keeps going. Um, you know, Jeff's been featured in numerous major food and wine magazines, such as New York Times, Los Angeles Magazine, San Francisco Chronicle, Eater, and the Financial Times. His career began in Napa Valley when he worked at Trevina in St. Helena. Then he joined the Bastianis Hospitality Group in 2009 at Osteria Muzza. And then in 2011, he moved to New York to become the director for Del Posto. God, I forgot how much you had going here. 2014, he was a beverage operations director overseeing the programs for Babo, Del Posto, Esca, Lupa, Otto, Babo, Pizzeria, and more. And in 2019, he left the Bastianis Group, began his consulting career, and also a web series about wine, life, and culture called The Sip Trip. Um, in 2020, good timing, he opened his own import business. <laughs> And then outside of beverages, Jeff is an avid home cook, doting father, passionate travel, and a lover of all things barbecue. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much. It's so good to be back, MJ. Thank you. I'm so excited to be your first two-timer. It's I know, like the man. SNL thing where I just get a two I know. instead of a five. I, know. He's like, <laughs> I have to get you a special patch. You ever see... um. What the hell is that? I love that movie. You, me, and Dupree. Where yeah. <laughs> we got to get you a special patch. We'll get you a Thunderbolt or something. I want that Thunderbolt. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to warm up a bit. Um, we're going to go in. Yeah, you did the 20 questions, but like, if you're like me, the answer is going to change. Um, no stress, no muss, no fuss. Answer them quickly. First thing that comes to your mind. You ready? Ready. All right. What's your favorite book? This is going to be the one thing that stays the same. It's Aldous, Huxley, Aldous Huxley's A Brave New World. And it's interesting I'm going to reread it. I just finished my dad's book. My dad is an author as well. Just finished his latest book, and I got my new copy of Brave New World. I've never read any book twice. It's the first time I've ever reread it. The last time I read it was 17 years old. So I'm going to see if it's still my favorite book. But as of right now, it's still my favorite book. That is a tr- – you've never read a book twice. Nope. Well, you know – that's really going to be really interesting because they say you should read like books you like. like You should revisit them every now and then. But this is a long visit. Yeah. Um, you definitely aren't the same person. You probably the book's going to be completely different because you're going to be completely because you are completely different. And that's I'm I'm excited. Like, yeah, it's, it's the first time I'm like nervous about yeah. it because I've s- built up so much about this thing that has been part of my identity. Because everybody's like, "What's your favorite book?" And right. I'm like, "Brave New World." It changed my life. Right. So we'll see if so. It, it really there. is a brave new world for you. Yeah. All right. Um, what's your favorite movie? Um. Right now, it's Inglorious Bastards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that movie. <laughs> okay but before that's glory i love glory oh glory was a great movie um who's your favorite musical artist wilco oh right wilco, mm, wilco. i know dad rock yeah man um what's your favorite uh food last meal death row it's still gonna be best brisket smoked texas style cool Central Texas or yeah, Central Texas. Salt and pepper just around Austin. Salt and pepper. That's it. Barbecue sauce on the side. On the exactly. Um, Who's your favorite athlete these days? I we're gonna get into this, but it is after knowing him better, Kevin Durant. Nice. Um, We'll get into that. Mm. Mm. He brought some good juice. He brought some good juice. You want some? Want to taste? Psych. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> that just dated myself guys can youtube that uh favorite cartoon animaniacs <laughs> i just love the name <laughs> it's a great it really is i love that um favorite cold cereal it's hard to remember because some people like we didn't have cold cereal in my house uh, that's a tough one uh you know i still think i i, I you know i'm gonna have to go back and listen to this thing because i'm not sure what i said but like in my head right now, it's cinnamon life. Okay. Hey, Mikey. Exactly. He likes it. Jeffy likes it. Jeffy, Jeffy likes it. He doesn't like anything. Um, current exercise routine. Um, I've been swimming. Really? My uh, YMCA reopened, and it's been easier to get a uh, like an appointment into the pool. And I swam in high school, and I start swimming again, and it's the 
it's truly my solace because you can't have a cell phone when you're mm-hmm. swimming. At least I, don't no one tag me and say, "Oh, you sure you I'm, can." I'm sure you can, <laughs> but but you know, I swim and uh, I count laps and I remember to breathe so I don't die. Oh, well, that's um, sounds like swimming. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite comedian, or have you listened? To, have you seen a comedy special you think was good? Some tips for people out there. Anything? Um, I still think one of the the funniest. Um, or most funny uh, comedians I've seen recently was Ronnie Chang's special okay. on on Netflix, I think. Uh, he has this whole thing about uh, Amazon Now. Wait, is that the little there. guy who was on... Um... He's on The Daily Show. Okay, okay. Um, but I really, I really love... I For some reason, that whole... That whole... In, in the zeitgeist of today, mm-hmm. that means a lot when it comes to like historical comedy... It's Pryor and uh, Carlin. Nice. Um, who would you most like to have a bottle of wine with? You get to now. You could, you could get a different person, or you might say the same oh. person. Who knows, right? <laughs> I barely remember what happened yesterday, so I'll have to see if I could have a wine with any person right now. It would still be Jesus. He's, I tell people that's like got to be the coolest. He literally turned water into wine. Well, I mean, that's what they say. Her, but, but you know. But work. Yeah. You gotta hang out with a guy. You'd be like, who? yo, Jesus, I really wanna try this wine. Can you do that for me? And he's like he's like, boom, there's Costa Rica oh six. <laughs> I know, right? He just <laughs> <laughs> he, Or I know that was a crap vintage. That's Costa Rica oh two or whatever. <laughs> like Oh he he turned water into wine and he hung out with hookers. So there you go. Sounds like a cool, oh, sounds right like a cool dude right to me. Now, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, Jeff, now we're gonna switch over to the 10 questions made famous by James Lipton on Inside the Actors Studio. Jeff, what is your favorite word? Well, fuck. <laughs> Still, that, that hasn't changed. Yeah, that's, that's usually not going to change. What is your least favorite word? Moist. I think a lot of people say that. But a lot of people say that. I'm, and I'm, I'm really going to, I'm going to, I could write a whole, I'm going to do an essay. I'm going to have to unpack that. I mean, do some, it's uh, a weird word. Yeah, literally. Idea you, is another one. You know what's so funny? When you were on, um, I talked about Brooke Sobel. Um, and when she came on, her least favorite word was moist, too. She's like, she's like, I, I can't go down the cake aisle at the supermarket. <laughs> See that Betty Crocker box? It's the moist. It's, it's super moist. <laughs> I, it's interesting. I like the word. I like the idea of idea. But like when you I D E A, mm-hmm. it's like a weird thing. Like having a little like my daughter just turned eight and like working with her through reading and everything. When you look at how words are put together, you're like how like the sounds of it. It's it's I don't know. It's a weird word. English is a weird language. Let's be Truth. honest. Um, what turns you on? Oh, a lot. <laughs> a lot turns me on, in a lot of different. Ma- you know, in in the in the carnal sense, my wife turns me right. on. Um, you know, to be honest, like conversation turns me on. Thought. Yeah, yeah. I watched a bunch of your shows after you on here, and you you definitely enjoy conversation. And like you, like you brought a burger last time, and but like the whole like the food and wine, like and and just watching your show, like and where you know they have different aperitivos before, and you're really taking the culture and really, I dig that about you, man. That's what's up. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> what turns you off? Stupidity. Yeah. Ignorance. Yeah. 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 Yep. Right there with you. Watching TikTok. I mean, I love TikTok. I'm like, since we saw each other last, I joined TikTok. I don't make TikTok. I watch it. I'm a voyeur. But holy shit. Sometimes you just like, you see kind of like the feed gives you things to like, yeah. just get you riled up. And you're like, how does this happen? How do I, people do think this? Like, I, it blows my mind. I hear you. I hear you on that. Like, you know, what are you going to do? Um, <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? I love farts. <laughs> I think farts are hilarious. They're the best. Oh, my God. Uh, they are funny. <clears throat> um, no matter what, it's hilarious. <laughs> Whether it's the silent but deadly in the elevator. All, all farts or, are funny. Or, or, just, or just the loud one. <laughs> 
Oh man, and you, you have to respect that person who does the SPD oh, just, yeah. in the elevator. Oh, You're my like, wow, God. that's that's aggressive. Damn, bro. Yeah, good for you. <laughs> glad we're <laughs> glad we're messed I've up. I've never these done days. that. Neither have I. That's I did that when I was a high school teacher, <laughs> and my kids called me out on it. And it was super like try to do it at your desk. And they yeah. just walked. They're like, Mister the Porter, what the, what the hell did you eat? <laughs> what died in you? <laughs> what sound or noise? What sound or noise do you hate? <laughs> um, the low murmur outside my window in Brooklyn. <laughs> That's always there when I try to go to sleep. Whatever the fuck that is, it needs to stop. <laughs> It's just like, uh, I'm like I, it's not it's not a human being. I, it's it's like maybe it's the earth. I don't know, yeah. but it's got to stop. Yeah, that's so funny. Um, mm. favorite curse word, same as your favorite words, just your favorite word. That's fuck yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Uh, still doesn't change. I'd love to be a politician. Yeah. Hmm. What profession would you not like to do? Uh, being a Somalian. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> you almost made me have my, almost had my first spit on the podcast. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't want to be that person that gets in like the swim, like the 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 scuba gear and has to go into not the ocean, but they go into like. Like the the places where all the like the 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 water treatment plants go and they have to fix the pipes inside, that doesn't that seems. I didn't gross. even think about that, but I'm sure that is that's got to be a job. I've seen that on TikTok. You see, <laughs> well there you go. <laughs> As seen on TikTok, shit diver. Don't want to be a shit diver. Yeah. <clears throat> and lastly, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? You done good, pig. <laughs> I love that. You don't convey. Well, that was fun. Um, if you want more of Jeff, and I know you do, make sure you tune in to his episode of the Black Wine Guy Experience. Hey, everybody, what's up? It's your boy MJ, and welcome to the Black Wine Guy Experience. My guest today is seasoned sommelier, wine educator, and founder of Volcanic Selections, Jeff Porter. Uh, Jeff has been featured in numerous major food and wine publications such as the New York Times, Los Angeles Magazine, San Francisco Chronicle, Eater, and the Financial Times, which you know is a, is a big you know uh, major food and wine uh, outlet. Yeah, it's the pink one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jeff's Somalia career began in Napa Valley, where he worked at Travigne Restaurante in Saint Helena. Uh, he then joined the Bastianich Hospitality Group in 2009 um, <clears throat> at Osteria Matza under the auspices of James. Beard award-winning chef Nancy Silverton. In 2011, he moved to New York to become the wine director for Del Pasto. And then three years later, in 2014, he became the beverage operation director overseeing the programs for Babo, Del Pasto, Esca, Lupa, Ato, Babo, Pizzeria, and more. Uh, in 2019, he left the Bastianis Group and began his consulting career in a web series about wine, life, and culture called Sip Trip. And in 2020, Jeff opened Volcano Selections and Import and Distribution Business outside of beverages, he's an avid at-home cook, doting father, passionate traveler, and a lover of all things barbecue. Welcome, Jeff. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> That's a, every. Uh, no. It was. I got a. I got a, a text today because I had, like put something on Instagram that I kind of been this new. I'm on this new adventure, and someone texted me. He's like, "Dude, I can't keep up. What are all your jobs again?" I listed them. It's like, man, ah, damn. I need to. I gotta stop saying yes. That's. I think it's a hard thing for some yeah. people is to stop. Is you can't say yes to everything, and I'm learning that, and I'm trying to be better at that. But uh, because sometimes you you lose sight of certain things when you keep saying yes. But I just love. This goes back to some of the questions you had had asked me in the the like the twenty questions or the ten questions. Is just I like experience. I want to like. Living when you have this verve and energy where it feels kind of like you've always got one finger in the socket <laughs> is a really cool experience. It means you, you, you like knows you're alive. Yeah, I get that. I get that. So this is Jeff Porter part two, guys. I, I should have put through in there. You probably figured it out. You're not listening to the same episode over um, <clears throat> because he came in and he he's such a great person, first and foremost. 
but conversationalist and just a lover of life and people and just he's got so many awesome stories. So um, I appreciate that. It's true, man. I know this is somewhat like this is I think the reason I like this so much is somewhat therapy. I like it. <laughs> I feel that. I feel like I'm going to pay MJ a little extra for this session today. Yeah. Uh, you know, we talk it out. We feel. Yeah. But um, I think a lot of times when you put uh, a career in perspective, specifically when you find a career early in your life, mm-hmm. like I did when I was in college, and it's a passion. Mm-hmm. And it's tough because when your passion becomes your career, there's days where you hate it. And to hate your passion hurts. Yep. And then you always got to find ways to to. It's it's just like a relationship. How do you rekindle the fire that you've been with for a long time? Yeah. And um, I think that's why there's this this urge to say yes. It's like, what else can I do to like to keep my finger in the socket? <laughs> like, uh, feel the energy, feel the electricity. Have have your when you do something right and you feel the 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 hair stand up on end. Mm-hmm. It's 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 a drug. Um, it's kind of crazy. Because, oh, let's back up. I'm sorry. It's all good. No, um, just uh, please tell everybody. What are we drinking, man? Like, uh, Oh, yeah. I'm talk, super psyched talk, talk about this about wine. wine. real quick. So, like, you know, I follow, I listen to the podcast. I look, you know, J.J. Reddick was here. Um, the, the Soil Pimp was here. <laughs> you know, and the last time I was here, like, I brought Dolcetto. And, like, oh, that's, by the way, dude, that Dolcetto was banging. Super good. Um, I got to get me some of that. I mean, but it's like. Like thirty five, forty dollar Dolcetto, but it's right. but it's so good. But you know, like I had in my hands, like like, you know, and it's it's not to like, you know, I wanna I wanna you know show off. There's the ego part of it, but like, for me, wine and specifically when I have this opportunity to tell a story, there's there's the things that kind of change direction in your life that help open your mind, and so this is Natty Valleys, uh, Stellenbosch and so so we're in South Africa. Mm-hmm. And, you know, South Africa is known for a lot of people for Pinotage right. and, and Chenin Blanc or right. Steen. Steen. Um, and I had been very fortunate enough uh, in the, like, 2007 to go to, to, to South Africa. And, you know, I lived in San Francisco at the time. It's like the longest journey oh, I've Jesus ever taken on a plane. I've, I've never smelled worse in my life. And you have, to go to South Africa, you have to fly east, right? You know, fly, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was, it was San Francisco, New York, New York, Paris, Paris, Cape Town. And it's just a lot of journey. And this is before I knew about points and how to <laughs> figure it. So I was like, and I'm a big guy. And, like, I'm not shitting you. Middle seat, oh. like, squashed, squ- like, bigger people on my sides. Like, I'm like, oh, this is the worst. Um, but that that moment, it was transformative It because it, it changed a lot in my wine career. Uh, a perspective about, like, I've always, I got into wine because I love the connection to history and everything. Mm-hmm. But the cool thing about the the trip I went on, it was with Vineyard Brands. Vineyard Brands at the time was importing a lot of different South African wines. And we stayed in Cape Town, and, and our, our host said, to understand South Africa, you have to understand our history. It's, it's, it's dark. It's intense. Um, and so we spent time in Cape Town. We went to Robben Island. And, you know, obviously I remember growing up in the 90s. And, like, the fact, like, when you think about it, you know, Mandela was only elected president in 1994. Mm. Think about that. Yeah. Apartheid was still in existence in the 90s. I know. That's fucking crazy. I know. Dude. <laughs> and <laughs> it's still blo- today it blows my mind. When like Desmond Tutu died the other day, my wife and I were talking about that. We're like, fuck, that's not that long ago. I mean, and like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I I had the whole Keith Heron poster, and I'm you know ain't gonna play Sun City, but like now being older. You're like shit. They basically still had slavery in 1990. Yeah, and the world was like okay with it. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> shit happened. Like they, they like, were they were like moving forward. Like okay, it was like it's like we can't do any business with Haiti or Cuba, but hey, South Africa, right? <laughs> You're cool. And so, like this guy took us to Robben Island, where where Mandela was was uh, you know in, in jail for so long, and. It hit me, you know, again, like I said, like I'm from, you know, small town in Texas. I, I didn't have, I was very blessed in my family. We traveled a lot. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of missionary work in Mexico as a kid. So, you know, but I didn't understand that experience. I understood it on paper, but I did, when you, when you go into Nelson Mandela's cell and you see what, you know, 
decades of of confinement look like it's it's it changes my changes your mind and and you have this 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 jail cell and this island and then you look over and you see table mountain you see one of cape town's arguably one of the most beautiful cities on the planet mm-hmm. and then you try the wines and you know the, the wine culture in in south africa or, or wines are, is still white dominated and and you know things are changing and there's obviously a lot of land issues and there's still a lot of issues to it but the the thing I love, like the wines are delicious there, and and, and they we, have a lot of old wines since so. right. And you meet people and you talk to them, and and they're working still to this day. And it's you know, conversely, yes, apartheid happened within our lifetime, which is still blows my mind. But there are people that are continually trying to figure out how to make things better for everyone. And you know, the owners of Natty Valley have have been pushing and and using what they can to mm-hmm. to make it more inclusive. And so that's that's the first thing. But from a wine perspective, this and so it's eleven something percent. I was introduced it introduced to the wine by a friend of mine who's from South Africa. He's like, try this wine, put a little chill on it, and it blew my mind. And and watching you know the, and listening to your podcast, I knew you like you know Southern Rhone varietals. And I Natty Valley comes. It's super small production. It comes in and it comes out. And I uh, Liz Nicholson who owns Frankly Wines. Mm-hmm always lets me know, hey, there's some bottles and you want some? And I was like, yes, because it's not very expensive. Right. Then it's something, it's, it's a wine of joy. Mm-hmm. And when you when I think of the Rainbow Nation, when you think of Desmond Tutu, when you think of, of Nelson Mandela, when you think of, you know, when I was in South Africa in 2007, and my family and I, I took my daughter and my wife uh, there in, right after I left BBHG, is the first trip I've ever taken in my life where I didn't have to like work on the trip. And it was transformative. Like, I love South Africa. I would move there in a heartbeat. I love the country. I love the people. They have a great barbecue culture. <laughs> um, Bilt Bong is also their great uh, yes, jer- jerky. their jerky, yes. Um, big fan of the I'm – a, I'm a, I'm a, when I'm on road trips, beef jerky is my, my food of choice, and Bilt Bong is, is way better. <laughs> um, and I love South Africa, and I wanted to share that because it, it, the wine means something to mm-hmm, me. And I think, I think that's – it may not be grown cru, it may not be aged, but it's delicious and it has a it has a purpose, and I think that's important. And you know, that's what I'm. That's why I love wine. Like it doesn't have to be like yeah. I, I love people come ball me out, you know, bring stuff. But like this is special. And and since those ones groups, you know, like as a Rome guy, you know, Rome wines, um, you know. They're all fourteen percent, okay? Like right, yeah. right. at least, right? <laughs> and then you know the newer producers, they're they're going, you know, they're pushing the envelope. I'm not a guy, but like since so, even like um, Tegan makes one for Terry, he makes one for himself, and mm-hmm. it's like twelve percent alcohol, and it's you, I'm like, it's a wine for me. You get so much flavor. It doesn't have to be high alcohol. You get so much. I know eleven percent alcohol. You just get so much flavor. Like it's so flavorful. Um, uh, whereas other wines are too green and stemmy for me if they, if you don't get to a you know like 13 or so um this is just it just and like i said it, it's a red you could drink you know chill it you could drink it in the summer you could you know do great food wine so yeah so that's why that's why i brought it. it it it's a wine that means something like i i and i i think again it could be a book it could be a movie it could be a song but like i think for 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 people like us like wines aren't just a label they they can tell your story. Yep, and wow. this this tells part of my story. I love it. I love it. So, um, <clears throat> we had you back Sorry. because no, don't don't ever apologize. But this is just literally. I said this last time. We're we are a couple of friends catching over a bottle of wine, and we're going. We're we're setting up a mandate. That's right. <laughs> right. We're gonna have this mandate. Yeah. And don't worry. The mandate. We're gonna we're gonna. That's where we we don't need to talk about what we're drinking. Yeah, we don't yeah. need to no, IG exactly. it. I, it's, it's, exactly. We'll bring the heat. Yeah. You just just it's like. I, I tell people all the time, like I, you know, I don't always like having to be on. Yeah, you amen. Know, you know, and 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 it's funny because I look at my Instagram feed and now it's like a lot of it is just it. I'm promoting the podcast. I, you know, I used to do a lot of reviews, but I'm like, I don't like. I, I'm, I love this, so I want to keep loving this. So like, I just, if I just want to drink some wines at home, I'll drink some wines. I'll take a picture. I may post them three months later if I want. But like, I just like. I love this shit. So, mm-hmm. so we left off. We and we finished with. Uh, uh, he was about to uh, 
bust some porn producer's ass because he was talking <laughs> shit. We were <laughs> still in L.A. Yeah, we were still in L.A. We were still in L.A., that motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say that? Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. That guy with fuck that guy. Oh, my God. I was talking about that story the other day. Someone asked me, like, what was the craziest thing? It's like, this guy asked me to fight. Yeah, exactly. It's like, are you an I'm adult? <laughs> and, and, like, me being an asshole, too, I was like, okay, I let's know. do this. Don't ask a guy from Texas. <laughs> As a six but I was foot. so hot. Like I was like, I was so I was like, all I'm trying to do is trying to help. I like when when you're trying to help someone and they just aren't listening, and you're like, you dude, you ordered a well done steak and it's two inches thick. It's not gonna take ten minutes. And he's like, cut it in half. I was like, if I go back there to ask the chef to cut that awesome, beautiful piece of meat in half. He already hates you because it's well I done. I know, right. <laughs> like, I mean, he's going to stab me. There's places I saw it on your show. There's places in Italy, like, you, 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 that's the way we serve it. If you, you got to go. That's my favorite thing. They're like, they're like the, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the truth. Right. You either accept the truth or you don't. Right. And obviously, we're in this weird, world, weird society or world now that where truth is subjective. <laughs> like, it's, it's, totally. it's crazy. <laughs> But yeah, okay, so we were at Moza. Yeah, we were Moza, Moza, like I, I, it's so, you know, obviously you look back at things in a, a nostalgic lens. It was, it was a transformative, amazing experience. I, I met so many people. The person that made me the wine professional I am today, and I have to give him a shout out, and I hope he comes here and you should interview him, is a guy named David Rosoff. I don't know if I talked to him. We talked did. About you mentioned him before, him before and I yeah. was like, I definitely want to interview him. Yep. David just opened a new restaurant in Los Angeles. Uh, in East LA. Let's go. And uh, I guess it's not technically East LA. It's like whatever. It's I don't I don't remember the parts of LA anymore. But it it's in a cool part of LA. East it's East LA because East LA is cool. Um, he he taught me attention to detail. He taught me tr- he taught me how to be truthful and honest and 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 lead with the heart. And I can't thank him enough. Like. You have those people in your life, and he 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 moved mountains to make sure I became a better person. And and like he would throw sometimes what I call emotional hand grenades. Um, so you'd be like talking, and then he'd say something that would kind of like mess with your your like your inner soul, and then just walk away. Like and some Obi Wan shit. Right? You'd have to deal with it. You're like, oh my god, how do you how do I process this? And you just like walk. It was like totally. You know, these are not the droids you're looking for. And you're like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I can work at a restaurant. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, David Rosoff, arguably one of the, the – and you can talk to a lot of people. A lot of people in the United States know who this guy is, and he's he's not famous. Right. He's never sought, this, sought the, the, the spotlight, but he's arguably one of the best – not wine professionals, hospitalitarians mm. on the planet. So that's L.A., Nancy Silverton, still to this day, the best chef I've ever worked for. Her palate, the the, the greatest. Um, I don't know. Did I talk about like sitting at the mozzarella bar and her just putting one thing on something and changing? No. All right. She, you, you in the restaurant business, you like when you you're a crazy idiot person. You come in like at ten in the morning, right. knowing you're not going to leave till one in the morning. Right. And. Uh, but you, you need quiet to get stuff done, to organize stuff. And so I'm sitting at the, it was called the mozzarella bar. And so they have this like big, beautiful place where they're doing things with antipasti. And she's like futzing with something. She's like, Jeff, try this. And I try this like crostini and it's mozzarella. It's this beautiful. And I taste it. I was like, oh, hey, Nancy, this is amazing. She's like, there's something missing. And I was like, oh, no, I think this is fantastic because I'm stupid. And she's like, hmm. She like 10 minutes later comes back. I see her cut literally like a micro millimeter of a cornichon puts it on top she's like try this now i eat it it's it's a nuclear bomb of flavor difference i'm like how's this happen and like everything she touched the thoughtfulness you could see it in her 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 eyes it's just this brain just always working on how flavor can be it's minute and like all these little parts and that again, that, that the Mozart exper- experience informed everything after. It was like there's there's before BM <laughs> bowel <laughs> movement and then PM. <laughs> like BM and PM is like before Mozart and after Mozart or AM. Um, and without that place, I'm a better cook at home. I'm a better sommelier. I'm a better 
person, I think, for have, having worked there. Nice. So then um, they got, well, they knew about you, but they, they said, we're bringing you up to the big leagues. We're bringing you over to New York. So um, your wife must have been happy about leaving L.A. Ooh, my mother-in-law sure wasn't. <laughs> So we had only been in L.A. for 18 months. My, 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 all my in-laws were, like, super psyched. They're like, oh, they're going to be here. And I honestly thought, I was like, oh, we're L.A., done. I'll never forget. I was rearranging the dining room with David Rosoff, the GM. And he was like, he's like, hey, Joe called and wanted to talk to you about going to New York. You know, I, didn't, I told him you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be interested. And I was like, what? She- <laughs> I was like, all my life since I was 13 years old, I've wanted to live in New York City. I wanted to be part of the energy. I wanted to experience this. And so I, I, I texted Joe. I was like, Joe, I'm totally interested. <laughs> and, and David took that as like a dagger to the heart. I like stabbed him right, right in the heart. So I flew out to New York. And it was that, I don't know if you remember, but it was uh, in 2010. There was a huge snor- s- snowstorm that hit New York. And like Bloomberg didn't put out any. Yeah, I remember because I I had just moved back and it was uh, Christmas. It was started snowing on Christmas night, and we never get we rarely get snow in Jersey. We got like three fucking feet in Jersey. Yeah. It, it, we got p- pounded. And no one was ready. Yeah, for no one's ready. It yet. shut down. Yeah, everything. It, it got yeah we got pounded. I remember that storm so very I, well. I came out right after that, and it was in between. That storm and another storm that hit in January, and then when that one in January came, Bloomberg had like everything ready, so it, like the city was was clear. But like, I was there when it was snowing. I was like, this is nuts. But you know, being from Texas, having lived in California, never been in snow, I've always want. I love snow. I was like, I'm in. <laughs> I met with Joe Del Posto. He's like, hey, we want this. And now it sounds like Trump. Um, <laughs> they're not that like... far. Um, and. Uh, and I was like, you know, this is this is the time. This is like this is the greatest Italian wine list in America. Uh, it's New York City. It's the the best city in America. Uh, let's do this. And he's like, can you be here in two weeks? I was like, dude, come on, that's ridiculous. I got to move my whole family here. But we came in four, <laughs> and we spent a week looking for an apartment. Uh, we flew it. Took the red eye. This is a funny thing. We had a car, and I put the car up on like Craigslist. I couldn't sell it, nothing. So I still hadn't sold the car. So we drove, there's a CarMax right outside LAX. We took the car to CarMax, said, how much for it? They gave us a check, went to LAX <laughs> with our bags, got on a plane, flew to, LA on the, or flew to New York on the red eye, woke up, had an, had a, an apartment. My wife had arranged an apartment viewing at 9 a.m., in Park Slope. And then we spent a week looking for a place and we found a place in Williamsburg and it wasn't ready till May. So we got there March 3rd. Mm. So we like couch couch surfed, uh, BBHG put us up over, I lived above Babo, I lived above Becco. And then we got like a sublet in Carroll Garden or no, Clinton Hill. And then moved into Williamsburg. And then Del Posto was the like next level, like I'll never forget because coming from LA, even though I was serving like John Hamm, Harrison Ford, the producer that the porn producer that wanted to be my face, the people had a lot of money. You know, in, in LA, this is before Uber and Lyft and everything. People had to drive home, so mm-hmm. like one bottle and done. Like yep. people were pretty smart about it. New York, ooh, and the level of money in this city is next is next level. And so I'm like I'm the wine director at Del Posto. And I'm working the VIP section, and I'm selling like eighty dollars bottle of wine, thinking I'm like hot shit. And all the psalms there, because they're all in the tip pool, and I'm salaried. They're like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, oh, "Dude, I just sold this awesome wine from uh, Lazio," and they're like, "Fuck you, sell the Barolo. <laughs> that costs a thousand dollars. What the hell are you doing?" <laughs> You're being all wine geek guy. Yeah, I'm all like, oh. I was like, "But look how happy they are," and they're like, "Dude." <laughs> This is New York City. Get with it. And that was that was a huge, that was a big opening. Like, that was like, wow, I could, like, check out what's going on. And so, you know, then being kind of an analytical person, I looked at, like, where the average bottle sold was, and it's like 300 bucks. Yeah. So I'm like, someone opens the list, and you point to someone that's 500 bucks, And they're like, yeah, no problem. Let's drink that. And you're like, what? 
never mind like, in Napa Valley. Like even the, all the super rich people that come out to Napa Valley or California, there's always this like hemming and hawing. In New York City, it's like thousand bucks, no problem. Done. I mean, you, you listen to the JJ podcast, which was funny yeah. because um, Jonathan was the, the Psalm who who waited on that night, and he's like, I remember that. He, he come, but like, you know, like. It gets serious in New York. I had a guest, um, Eric Jensen, was on. We haven't dropped that. We're going to drop that. And he was in town celebrating. Constellation just bought Booker Vineyard. And so they were taking him out to dinner. And, and like, damn, they, like, just one of the bottles they had was a $45,000 bottle of DRC. Like, that's what happens in New York when you go to yeah. Love Madison Park. Like, it fucking $250,000, $300,000 dinner bills happen. And you're selling the eighty dollar bottle, <laughs> and, like, and everyone's hating. Me. Like the servers are like, "Who the fuck? Who the fuck they, is who this? Is this <laughs> chunky, smiling, happy person in New York City at a restaurant? <laughs> fuck this guy!" And so it was like, you know, I still didn't. I like, hopefully, to this day, I, I it never became a dour person. But I learned pretty quickly that I could sell a lot more expensive wine. <laughs> Uh, which was which was cool. It was like, it was mind opening. And, and like the other thing at Del Posto is like, you know, the beauty of Del Posto is they like j- when Joe and Mario set it up from a wine perspective. Um, you know, they were like, we want this place to be the Metropolitan Museum of Art of of wine, not in a museum sense where it like just stays there, but like it's all encompassing. So you've got all the greats. So like the Met has all the great periods of art. And then it intersperses it with kind of like more avant-garde stuff. It's mm-hmm. not the Whitney, it's not the Frick, it's not MoMA, but it, it kind of shows the whole thing. And that's what Del Posto was. Del Posto was everything. And they're like, and then buy for tomorrow. Like how many, like not many sommeliers have the opportunity to buy for tomorrow. What buy for tomorrow means is like when the allocation for Borlo comes out, buy 10 cases of that wine. And then we had so much wine we didn't have to release it. Like I had a release schedule. So if I bought a wine in 2008, we weren't going to release it to, or uh, uh, 2008 would come out in 2012. Right. I wouldn't release it. I wouldn't allow it to be on the list until 2016. That's like a dream. Yeah. That's like a dream for a wine director. It was, it was the, I mean, it was arguably the, the one of the best jobs in the wine industry ever. And I, I was lucky to have it. And, there's so many people that came through that restaurant. So many amazing sommeliers. Ginny Guizio, who's now the, the the corporate beverage director for Union Square Hospitality Group. Mike Zima, who runs arguably one of the greatest fine wine collections in America called Psalm Picks. Um, uh, oh, my God. There's uh, like Joe Cuvo, who's in, in Portland running a restaurant out there. So many sommeliers that, that, that worked with me on this team that defined this place like in pre before me this guy named henry devar who's amazing morgan rich who works for Polaner, and and you know i was a curator i was a person that and, and i know that's overused a lot in our our terms but this was literally like a museum it's like i was given millions of dollars to spend mm-hmm. to build this this wine list and we did like when so eventually obviously you know COVID happened the mario scandal or I don't even know what the, the, the right term is, but, you know, um, you know, Mario got, got his comeuppance and, um, and, you know, things kind of went downhill and then COVID happened and they decided to sell the restaurant and they sold the, the, they put up the, the whole cellar for auction. And to, to, I watched the auction. I remember I was at my friend, friend's house and i was just watching the auction on my phone i was like fuck i bought all this wine <laughs> and the interesting thing is when i go out today like with certain friends or collectors or i'm invited to certain things people people bring the wines they bought at the auction and it's it's mm. it's, it's it's interesting it's it's kind of like a, it's it's this, it it hurts and it feels good at the same mm-hmm. time it's like oh wow i made a really cool purchase I'm like damn that was such a cool wine list yeah yeah that's so fucking cool. So you did a great job there. So then they had you take over beverage director for all the restaurants in the group? Right. So one thing that I did is being very anal 
and looking, you know, at the at the end of the day, restaurants a business, yep. and yep. the the cost of doing that is high, and, and you know, people are complaining, you know, like oh, the margins, oh, the markups are so high, you know, like labor is expensive. Um, the glassware that we used at Del Posto, the the wholesale cost of one glass was forty five dollars. So if a, a guest accidentally broke a glass, that was forty five bucks. Yeah, the plates cost fifty dollars. There's a lot like people don't understand how much money goes into X and for restaurants like there's other businesses where they're just getting away with murder. And some restaurants like I was just out to lunch prior to this and I was like looking at the prices like, are you fucking kidding me? It's like I've been out to lunch in a long time. I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> I was like, thirty five dollars for four pieces of crudo. I, I... Fuck you. <laughs> like, and the plate's like bullshit too. It's like Libby. Yeah, it's, like, uh, it's not it's like even a awesome. Plate, right? Like <laughs> it, it should like float to me. Um, but uh, you know, the things things at Del Posto were really pretty and you're paying for the experience and there's a lot, you know, we we would have like let's say two hundred guests a night and we'd have a hundred employees a night. Mm -hmm. So it was like two to one. Um but uh so I I really focus on the numbers and I, I tried to make the math work. So I was taught early on that the business creates the art. So if I could create a wine program that's financially stable, I could do whatever I wanted. And I achieved that and it became successful. And so they're like, Hey, we're not doing this at the other restaurants. We'd like you to, to look at it. So I, 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 they gave me Bobo and Lupa first. And the first thing that always starts with wine programs, people don't understand is organization. If, if, if stuff's not organized, how do you sell it? Mm -hmm. And people are like, you know, the Baba wine list is this wine list that like, that started everything. It's huge. It's gigantic. It's, it has so much depth. David Lynch is another person. Hopefully you can interview. He's, he's one of my idols. Um, and to have my hand in what he started was such an honor. Uh, but it was, it, by the time I got there, it was like just a disorganized giant clusterfuck. And, and so the first thing was just to add bin numbers. How do you, and, and it's, it, it seems like so trivial, but I always said like, if everyone's hit by a car, everybody gets sick, who, how do you find wine? Because the ultimate idea about a restaurant is <clears throat> if you order a b bottle of wine, you should get it within a certain amount of time and be happy. Mm hmm but if everyone's sick and no one's no know, knows where anything is, it's going to take forever in a giant wine cellar. So we just, you know, spent a lot of time organizing. Excuse me. <coughs> spent a lot of time organizing, and it seems it's the the very unsexy part of, of right, restaurants. Right. Uh, so I did a lot of that, kind of reorgan, just lots of reorganization. Did that at Lupa, and then we we showed through just organization we in increased sales, increased profitability. And the, the biggest thing we introduced at all the restaurants is this idea that you don't have to be fixated on percentage. So restaurants have always been, from a business standpoint, we need to make a percentage at the end of the day. Well, why not focus on how many dollars you want to make at the, at the end of the day? It's a business. Perce you can't, like everyone says, you can't take percentages at the bank. You need to maintain a, a certain percentage. You have to do both. Right. And so, like at Del Posto, we had 70, 700 references of champagne. It was obnoxious. It was one of the greatest champagne lists in the city. Not very many people knew about it. I was obsessed with champagne. And then one day I woke up. I was like, well, we're not selling very much champagne. It's a huge inventory dollar amount. Well, what if we made it just retail or a little above retail? So a little above retail for, let's say, Provo. Still 125 bucks. We take that money to the bank, and they still buy a bottle of thousand dollar Barolo versus a glass of champagne and a thousand dollar Barolo. That really changed my mentality. Excuse me. Sorry. <coughs> Not COVID. I know. Like, if, if the podcast uh, <coughs> goes off the air. <coughs> that is, um, that is a, uh, an issue now that like, you like, you don't want to cough or sneeze. People think you got COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you good? Uh, you were like, you're like, it's not gonna be two hours. It's only four fifty five. I don't know. I know. I'm like, I'm like whatever. So that's my that's my problem. I talk too much. I like, <laughs> I like to provide all the details. My wife is like, when you explain how to take directions, you like tell like twenty different. 
things that are in the area. I was like, I want people to understand where they are. Yeah. I'm like, so they'll know they're not lost. <clears throat> take a look around. When you get to that corner, take a look around. There'll be this over there. Right. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, so when we implemented this idea of not just looking at percentage and margin, but like, you know, total dollars, we were able to redo the whole pricing model. And so like, I started instituting this thing called the Easter egg, uh, kind of like you would have in a DVD or a game where oh, yeah, yeah. at Del Posto, so like uh, Giacomo, Inter Giacomo, Inter Giacomo, I'd say that fast one time, Giacomo Conterno, Cascina Francia, 2001, Barolo. And this is in like 2017. We had bought it way back, so the price wasn't like crazy high, but we had marked we had marked it up to like um, like market value. Yeah, 2017 price. And I was like, this is crazy, and we weren't turning very much of it because the market value was super expensive. We had a lot of it. Well, I was like, well, why don't we every so often every like pump it out for like two weeks? No Instagram, no like Twitter, <clears throat> just if people look and they're like, holy shit, this is 125 bucks. So we started implementing it at the restaurants. We're getting these little hits everywhere. And that's the joy of wine. Like, why not share it? Mm. When you're doing the right, as long as, like, as long as you're, the business creates the art. I, I tell everyone I mentor, the business creates the art. You make your business sound, you can do the coolest shit you want. Oh, 100%. That's what it's about. 100%. I love that. I love that. And that's such a cool idea, just like. That's just so cool. It's like, oh shit, it's hundred twenty, and the people, because then people come back, because they go, how long? And they're like four hundred dollars, right? Exactly. Or they come back, or they come back, and uh, you know, <clears throat> sooner than they would, just because they mm -hmm. want to drink it again. You know, exactly. And they weren't only just buying one bottle, right? So like, if you can get Cascina Francia for one hundred twenty-five bucks, your art, you're gonna buy another bottle of wine. Yep. And it's gonna have to be good because that would call that wine. So you're not, right. They're not gonna be like, yeah, give me that eighty dollar from Lazio. Yeah. <laughs> You know, not if that not if that can turn over. Nah. You're not a shrub. Yeah. You know, like. <laughs> so um you know, you, they gave you two and then it went, you know, and then and then they gave you know, what's it like running how many restaurants in total were you responsible for as a beverage director? Fourteen at the end. What the fuck? Shit. It was almost sixty million dollars in business just for wine. It was a lot. It was cool. It was intense. It was um and it, it went through a lot of iterations because at first I was very controlling. And that was my own id, my own ego mm -hmm. or whatever. I don't, I don't know, alter ego. It ego, was everything. Id. <clears throat> and then I realized, you know, my job is just to help help people like learn and move forward and, and be a part of it. And so then I just created budgets and said, you know, just hear the budgets, buy to your budget, understand the philosophy. Here's, here's I'm the referee. Here's the playing field. Stay within the playing field. Do what you want. The business creates the art. Is there anything more fun than buying uh, wine on somebody else's dime? No, that's just there right. Isn't. <laughs> there isn't. Maybe making a movie on someone else's yeah, dime. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Probably. Like, I don't know. Even even a someone who, even a director who, drinks wine was like, I'd love to buy wine. No, no. <laughs> it's it's. When I look back again, I, I like I. As much as. As much as things have changed and things were hard in the past two years, you know I'm I'm extremely blessed and I'm fortunate, but to 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 do what I've done, nah. So let's talk about it's the good. past two years. So you you were there, so you did that um, for five years, and then in 2019, you 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 hung up your uh, your spikes, so to speak. Right. I was I was done being a sommelier. I was done because the interesting thing is like at the, at the restaurant, I, I'd always I was always a filler. So if someone was sick, you know, the, the problem with restaurants, restaurants is body count. You got to have a certain number of people to, to make it happen, right? And so like, oh, this wine director was sick or this person was, can you help? Can you help? And I made the like, I was fuck. I was like, yeah. And I'm like with my kid and I get a like text. I'm like, oh, we need someone to help. I'm like, huh. And I had, to, I had to create a boundary. But eventually I just got tired. Uh, I'd done it for a long, long time. And um I had some other opportunities in front of me, and I was like, you know, this has been great. Um, you know, the company had obviously gone through. Mario had been, um, you know, called out on his his horrible behavior, and and you know, rightfully so. And and you know, the company obviously struggled. And I, I I'll put it out there. I pitched to them to become like the the COO, the 
I was like, you know, this is an opportunity for us to change the culture. Like the one thing that Del Posto and Jeff Katz, who's the general manager at the time, and he's the the the, the partner in, in Saga and and um, Crown Shy. He was always so above board and, and always putting people first, and and that was the mentality I w- always really loved. You know, and, and being you know people people say whatever they say, but being the being the boss is hard. And and he was the boss at you know a flagship restaurant. And, you know, you have to make some hard calls from for a lot of different reasons. And but he was always putting the the team and and the the people first. And I always took that to heart. And he was another person that I look to as inspiration as a mentor and you know I put forward like hey I'd love to be the COO and, and kind of help reconcept new ideas and stuff like that and add this culture and they're like yeah no no we got this <laughs> we don't we don't need you. you you do your wine thing and I'm like okay they said go go over there don't shut up yeah you, <laughs> you weird goth you, you, <laughs> you want to sell $60 wine Jeff <laughs> I was like I fucking do want to sell $60 wine and also, like, ensure that people are getting their due and ensure that healthcare is okay and <laughs> and make sure that the workers are taken care of. Um, you know, in the past two years, I've become an avid Marxist. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> worker, capital's nothing without the workers. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I made the decision to leave. And uh, I left on July, January 4th, 2019. And, and I had set up prior to that SIP trip. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I had this dream. We'll go way back. I had a I had a blog back in the blogging days. Blog called uh, Learning the Vines, and I uh, hated the name. Um, my partner David Curiel, who's a rabbi now, who I love to death. He lives in Massachusetts. Uh, the the wine drinking rabbi. Uh, a lot of all rabbis. I was like, drink, all yeah, rabbis yeah, drink yeah. wine, but this is like the wine selling rabbi, I should okay. say. <laughs> Um, he and I did it and then he, he left and I kept writing the blog and even when I lived in, in New York and then eventually I just got too busy. Um, and I just didn't have the passion left and, um, but in my head I was always thinking, you know, I want to, I want to get in front of the camera and just show people like that anybody can do this. You can, you can be passionate about wine. You can learn, you can mm-hmm, experience mm-hmm. it. And I was at a conference in Verona and I was talking about this idea. I was like, you know, hey, I want to do this kind of like road trip thing where I show people how to do what it is to do like a wine road trip. And and her name was her name is Claire. And she's like, oh, that sounds like cool. Let me let me talk to my boss. I think he can figure out a way to fund it. I was like, really? And this goes to show to everybody out there when you have a dream. <laughs> the worst anyone can say to you is no. So just always put it out there. 100 percent and if they say no and you still believe in it try a little try something different F- finesse it and if they keep saying no maybe it's a bad idea <laughs> you know i mean like you know i, I post someone posted on instagram today and i reposted it was uh stan lee talking about when he pitched spider-man and they're like that's a fucking horrible idea people hate spiders Superhero, you know, a teenager can't be the superhero. They're the sidekick because of Batman and Robin. And they're like, literally, you don't know what a superhero is. How can he have problems? Superheroes don't have problems. And, like, he ran it anyway. And, like, it was, like, the biggest hit. And then the editor was like, remember that Spider-Man idea? You it's <laughs> the, the, the results are in. But you, and, and, and he said, I reason why I tell you this is because if you, if you really have something that you believe in, you got to put it out there. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So what? Right. I mean, at the end of the day, so what? Right? Like, you know. Um you got to do what's in your heart, and, and if you feel it's in there, you didn't do it. So, t- so you did that. You 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 just mentioned you were going to do this, show people the proper way to do a a, a wine road trip. Um, so, Claire comes back. How soon? How later? Within the day, she was the like, same fucking day. She's like, she's like, my boss wants to meet you. I was like, okay. And so I I do like an elevator pitch, like, and this was like all just in my head. I n- written nothing down. And he's like, oh, that sounds really interesting. Let me let me get back to you. I was like, oh, no one's going to get back to me. Like a week later, he's like, I think I figured out a way. Can you write a more formal proposal? I was like, okay. So I write this form. This is at the end of 2018. And then 
he puts it out there. He raises the money. We form a production company. Um, and we hire, I interview some people to be the director and the, the camera people. And we figure it out and we, we shoot 90 days um, in Italy. And we go for it and we do it. And it still to this day is professionally the, the coolest thing I've ever done. And the most fun and like where I feel like I, I had a voice or have a voice had or have i don't know where i'm at with that but you're, you're talking some, now I'm somewhere you're, so you're talking um from you first sharing the idea to arriving in italy to film what was that time frame six months damn it was fast that is unheard of fast that's Very really fast, fast. Yeah. You did not get lost in turnaround. <laughs> no, 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 no lost. I mean, we we did it as bare bones as you could do, um, with still raising a, a good amount of money because it's like you have we had a director, two camera people, sound person, and then myself, and then we would fly uh, other sommeliers. I know the wine Dude, slaps. This wine right? does slap. Um, I'll tell you what it. It really smells like when we're off air. <laughs> but I love that smell. Yeah, because <laughs> um, yeah, I, was, I was peeping the show, and like, and you were flying certain psalms in. So how many times did you fall off the bike on that rainy day, man? Like, just twice. <laughs> it just, just looked twice. like I said he probably busted his ass. No, I was fucking – it was hard. I was like, I thought this was going to be a lot easier. I know you <laughs> No, it was it was in, in, it was so interesting. So like, I was the producer, yep. uh, I was the driver, I was craft services, I was <laughs> I was the porter. Uh, I, I I did it. I was the connection. I I, I you know I, I had someone from uh, the the person to help fund it. Uh, he gave me like one of his people, and and she was the kind of like help also pre produce stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a lot of work, but it, it was it was it was so enjoyable and so interesting. Um, and then the funniest or the, the most funny thing is you'd get to a place and you'd pre, you'd pre-produce a segment with a, a producer or a restaurateur where you're going to. And this being Italy, he would get there and like, ah, oh, we don't want to do that anymore. And so like everything is like off the rails from the get go. And my original, so like the first shoot, I'll never, I cried so much on the first like few weeks. I like bawling. I'm like this is fucking horrible, I, you because you put so much out there. You're like you're on camera, you're spending your whole day just being energetic. You're trying to pump up the small yays. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get the camera people because you're the producer. You're the you're it. I just ball. Um, but that was cathartic, and but it was so funny. I was like I was like we're gonna do the cinema verite. So like this idea like you just start shooting and you capture stuff come to learn that's not how anything is done cinema verite is one crazy expensive because you have to like record hundreds of hours of film and that that's just that's expensive within itself to edit but you need to have a you ha, you need to have a begin even if it's a documentary you need to have a beginning middle and end i didn't know this this is all like no i'm learning <coughs> the story arc thing man they're talking about <coughs> yeah there's an arc and you can cr you you like for me i was i didn't want to create a story but then when I talked to the director and, and, and the other camera people, it's like, you know, like you have an idea. That idea is the story. It's like, so how do you get it from point A to point B? Mm -hmm. And so once we got that, uh, it just became a lot easier and more fun. And it was, it was I mean, we had car wrecks. We, had, <laughs> we were in helicopters. We were on a volcano. Oh, um, yeah, did the volcano erupt when you were there? Well, yeah, it was erupting right behind us. Um. It, it was it was insane and like it's you know even in my heart in my heart I'm still trying to do more because I feel like I feel like my ability to tell the stories and 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 connect with the people in an interview context is there you know it's it's hard you know COVID sh it it didn't shut a door I feel like but it it it, it put a it put a roadblock in front of me because we. We uh, so we filmed all throughout 2019, right? Um, 
in between shoots. So we didn't do it 90 days straight. Uh, we'd fly for like two weeks, come home because I had to work too. I, I didn't I didn't make money doing this. This was all like we raised money, right? And then I had to ha- I had to have a job, <clears throat> and so I had gotten some con- some some consulting gigs. So I was consulting for Red Hook Tavern, Hometown Barbecue, uh, Billy Durney, who's a, a dear friend of mine, opened a restaurant in Miami. So I went down to Miami. Uh, I got hired to be this consultant for this uh, hotel in Italy. So I was doing all these other things, and things were going really, really well. And then my wife and I were talking about this just the other day, and, you know, because I am blessed, and, and, you know, and my life is good, and things are okay, but you have ups and downs as a, as a normal human being, and and I was I was like, fuck, you know, just things are just like, they're, they're harder than they've been. And... In 20, at the end of 2019, November 2019, I was flown to China by the Italian government to give a sommelier, or to give, sorry, I was flown to China by the Italian government to give a seminar on Italian wine to Chinese sommeliers. And I'm an American. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> there was a bunch of Italian psalms who weren't happy with Jeff. Um... And that 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 was a kind of a like a a, a seminal moment, a, a, a pinnacle. Did that come out of? Do you think that came out of your work in Italy? Definitely. I mean, yeah. it came out of just like me being so entrenched in Italian wine culture. And I I think the other part is like, you know, I I, I look at Italian wine because I'm not in it. I'm not Italian. Um, I'm not a, even Italian American. But it's my it's the thing I love. It's I live Italian culture. Mm-hmm. Um, but I look at it differently. So there's a reverence. And I, I, I find like in any subculture that you get into, be it rockabilly or or hip hop or anything, and you come in it and you're not you're not really part of it, you like dig deep. Like when you when you see uh I, I've noticed this I married into a Jewish family, but I didn't convert. But when I see people who who marry into a Jewish family and they convert, they become so tr- entrenched mm-hmm. in 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 Judaism, and they know so much more. It's it's, right. it's you know you, it's new. It's something interesting, and that's kind of how it was for me in, in Italian culture. It's like that was my my thing that grasped on because I come from a family that's you know we don't we have our own culture, I guess, to an extent, but it's not. You know, my family's been here for hundreds of years in, in the in the colonies. We are like the colonizer, the modern warrior on TikTok who I follow and I love would be like, hey, colonizer. And I'd be like, hey, how's it going? I see you. I hear you. I respect. I understand my place and what I can do better. Yeah. Um, but well, I, I felt something unique about Italian culture. I, it's, a, it's a way of life that I love. Excuse me. Yeah, no, I love what you said, that reverence. I was watching, I was watching the, this Vice series they did this summer, but I, I rarely watch things when they come out. I watch them when I can binge them. So over Christmas, actually it was last week, Christmas, my ass. Um, Vice, did a, Vice did the dark side of the 90s, and, and, and one was on hip-hop. And, you know, the most influential magazine for hip-hop was The Source, started by two Jewish kids at Harvard, you know what I mean? Because like you said, you, you have a different lens, right? Because when you're, it, it, you have a, if once you get into something, you just said like, you have, you can have more respect than people who are even in it. Because they're in it. Like when you're in it, you're just doing it. But when you, like you don't realize, you don't realize the enormity of what you're doing sometimes, you know? So like for you, like, yeah, people, you know, um, all over the world they have wine culture, but like, like you, like how we start like like when you go to South Africa you go holy shit like very few South African psalms are like oh I'm going to rob another they're not thinking about you know the actual history right uh, what what is everything that's in that bottle because of its point of origin and so yeah that that is very true like you said like you know people you just it, it it's it's just that great it's that reverence that's such a great word like reverence for for a culture or or something um, is it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And it, it it was another, like, I'd say the irrespective of, of my, like, meeting my wife and having a child, the two things that have been transformative in my life that have, like, opened my eyes. Teach for America. 
teaching in South Central Los Angeles and then doing SIP trip. Um, even though uh, Italians are Western Europeans, I'm of Western European ancestry, but I'm not Western European. No, I mean, listen, if you're English speaking, <clears throat> it's not the same as continental. Right. <laughs> it's not it's the not, same. It's not the same, bro. <laughs> You know, like, you know, it's just like, you just talk funny. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's, it is not like the, it is, you're literally talking, because most people are Anglo, they're islands, off in the upper cold part of the Atlantic Ocean. Wasn't a lot of food culture until recently, actually, you know right. what I mean? But there, it you're talking centuries, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? You're talking thousands of years of this We've done this for thousands of years. Yeah, and it's it's beautiful, and um, I I love Italy. Um, I drink wines from all over the world. Like we have this wine from South Africa, and I respect wines from everywhere. But when it comes to me, my wine culture is Italian. Yeah, like there's hundreds of varietals. There's thousands of years of history. There's it's so interesting too because in our wine community, it's the place that's glossed over and it's still the number one imported wine in america like as a as a, as a total volume and mm -hmm. obviously it's probably the, it's all the shit stuff but you know the wsct gives a few pages to italian wine the master sommelier thing it's you know a few pages everything's so franco-centric i mean and i get i get it i love french wine but i mean the, the you think about without the Romans, there'd be no, there'd be nothing yeah. when it comes to the wine culture everywhere else. I mean, obviously, you'd probably get there eventually, but it just wouldn't be there. But like that, that again is is what you know Trevina taught me, and it's it's also people ask me is like why? Because like my you know I have a French flag tattooed on my arm uh, because I'm an idiot, <laughs> <laughs> not not because of France, because I'm just stupid. Like when I was 21 years old, um, but. When, when I started really tasting wine, even before I got to Italy, it was Italian wine that spoke to me first. Mm -hmm. It told me a different story. Mm -hmm. It told me a story of, of confusion, of, of, of chaos, of history, and that's, that's the beauty of it. It's, yeah. it's, it wasn't about chateaus or anything like that. Yeah. It was all the other crazy shit. Uh, and that's, that's what we try to explore in, in, in Sip Trip because we – we showed both. We we showed the the crazy big fancy stuff, and mm -hmm. we showed the itty bitty mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. and showed all the varietals in between, and the people, and the food, uh, and uh, you know, I I hope I'm still working on different things to try to continue to be able to tell that story. Yeah, so cool. So you were doing all this consulting. Um, you wrapped Sip Trip, um, and then you said. Yo, baby, I'm going to start an import and distribution business. I did. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was presented with an opportunity, and, and the, the person was like, hey, would you be interested? And I was introduced to a, a kind of an angel investor, and they like, you know, are you interested in, in maybe doing an import thing? And I was like, you know, I, there's plenty of producers I've met that I'm really fond of that I'd love to tell their story. And he's like, we'll put together a plan. So I put together a plan uh, with a friend of mine. And we asked for a certain amount of money. And we got a quarter of what we asked for. And my friend was like, oh, I can't I can't really be a part of this. I got a family to support. And I'm all like, you know, I'm doing cool things with my consulting gig. My wife's got a good job. I'm going to go for it. I got this. <laughs> <laughs> so that was right before Thanksgiving 20, uh, 2019 right after I got back from China. Um, and, you know, I put together, I, I already had reached out to wineries, I put together everything, got everything set up. Um, and my first load of wine came to the United States on March 6th, 2020. And I had a party, like a, 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 a an event set up for 16 sommeliers at Peking Duck House on March 14th. Which is the dope by one of the dope byobs in the city 20 storied yeah so <laughs> i'm like you weren't watching the news bro 
I was watching the news, but I was, I'm an optimistic person. I mean, but we, I, mean, I was, you know, we were all kind of thinking like, well, I wasn't. I was, I was kind of following it back then. Um, and uh, I was like, oh, this shit is crazy. Um, but yeah, so, so you didn't have your super spreader event. I didn't. No, we canceled the event. Okay. Um, the city shut down. And I, it's interesting. I was talking to someone else earlier about this today. Like, I honestly don't think. A lot of people in America, let alone Europe, understand what happened in New York between March and the end of May. You know, when you look at the numbers, over 34,000 people died in New York I City. Know, bro. Just this city. And the... Oh, fuck it. It's my show. The, you brought it for me. Yeah, there you go. It's oh, yours. The, so good. The ambulances, the noise, is interesting. There was noise and there was lack of noise. <clears throat> I think I can only imagine because I started the podcast. The first episode was like September third or something of twenty twenty, and I came to the city, and obviously I hadn't been in the city. Probably hadn't been in the city since twenty nineteen for whatever reason. Um, and I was like, and I grew up here, and I was like, whoa! It was like I am legend. Yeah. So I and that was six months. I can imagine when it first happened when we had the toilet paper. What must have been bananas to be like everybody was out like on March seventh, and then on March 9th, it was like whew, it was like tumbleweeds. Like it was crazy. I mean, the funny thing is, so I was in Miami uh, right before the city shut down, and I, I remember being on the phone call because one of my friends texted me and be like, "Dude, De Blasio is going to shut everything down. You need to go home." I was I was there setting up the new wine program at Hometown Barbecue in Miami. And I was like, oh, this is kind of scary. My wife, the, the two days before um, I left, the place where I was staying, the apartment that I was staying at was right near Trader Joe's. And she was like, yo, I need you to buy these groceries because there's nothing near us. Please do it. So like when I got on the airplane, I had two grocery bags that I put in the overhead compartment of food that I bought that morning to take back to my house. That's bananas. Of like vegetables and fresh food, fresh, fresh food. That's bananas. There, there was nothing in our neighborhood that we could get. And so it was like all ready to launch. And uh, it was definitely like, you know, like you think about Wiley Coyote and like he, him lighting the, the match to blow up the, the TNT to have like a big explosion <laughs> to kill the, kill the roadrunner and it was like a fizzle and you know we have a daughter she was in school public school shut down my wife worked for nyu langone which is the medical center she's she was the head of marketing and so their job was to tell everybody twitter instagram mm. she made all the all the posts that were telling people wash your hands what mm -hmm. to do and so she was in just constant like barrage 24 7 like her phone was blowing up and so my job was to take care of my kid and like figure out what the fuck was going on and it was um you know for i had all this wine just in a wa warehouse mm. sitting there costing me money and the first case i sold of wine happened in july who was that to who we're gonna big up right now uh the big up big was, up Jeff's uh, first case of wine. frank's wine bar in Carroll Gardens. My dear friends, John Burns Patterson, who's moving to Nashville, love that guy, and Matt Wolf. They were the first people to buy wine for me. Um, and it was slow going. And, you know, you couldn't set appointments. And the interesting thing is, obviously, when you move from small yang to distribution, you have friends. Right. <clears throat> but I was under no illusion that my friends were going to buy Just wine. Just buy your wine. That, right. That's not right. like, I'm not about that. I want them to like the wine. I don't want pity buys. But, you know, no one want. you couldn't see anybody. So I had to mail samples. I had to drop off full bottles. And normally, you know, you know you're know, you not doing that. Yeah, you, you're out on the street. You know, you go around in a bottle. You might have something to even bring home at the end of the day. Right. You, you know? So in my first year, so from... So when I was able to start selling wine, like June, or trying to send, from June to December of 2020, I gave out 78 cases of wine, full wine bottles. Yeah, that was that for for like, um, you know, a podcaster. I didn't even have the podcast in, but like, people needed to sell wine. Like they were sending 
influencers like i got so why was showing up every fucking day out of the blue people wouldn't even tell me it just 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 show up um those days are over yeah <laughs> i'll send you some wine no i'm good yeah. man but i, I, I always you. take it but um i'd rather drink wine with you yeah um but but it, I can imagine what's it like because, you know, that's that's the thing. You hit the bricks. You got your, you know, you got your, your whatever samples you're bringing, you know, your six or seven bottles or whatever. You go around, you pour, you talk, you know, you have lunch somewhere, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there's none of that. Yeah, none of that. And, like, you can't – people don't want to see you. It's dangerous. Right. Like, and the other – like, from from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., I was a school teacher. Oh, man. What was that like? The worst. That's... The worst. I'm a good teacher to adults and high school students. I I'm, I can explain shit. I cannot teach people how to read. I mean, the the number of tears in my household between my daughter, wife, and I was next level. Like the yelling, the scr- and like you like teaching your own kid is literally the worst thing on the planet. And you know, most of us we didn't realize. Like, I've been with my wife. We've been together ten years. Uh, oh, last last year of our first date, but like we spent the most time we'd ever spent. <laughs> and you're like, like, oh shit, do I like this person? I'm like, I don't think she likes me, because <laughs> because the, we're doing our lives, you know what yeah. I mean? And even your kid is doing her life. She's got like, you know, and you come home and there's a kiss and dinner. How was your day? Not like you're like, damn, I gotta put. You're like. It, it was a lot for a lot of people. It was it was a, it was like a, a reality check. I mean, we were blessed. Like I've been with my wife since two thousand one, so the October two thousand one is when we started dating, and we got married in 07, and we had Beatrice in two thousand fourteen. And uh, my wife is my best friend. She's the greatest person in my life. She's made me a better human being. Um, I would do anything for her. Um, same with my daughter. And we became stronger partners because she had so much going on with the hospital. I had, I had to step up. And the interesting thing is before that, like, I worked nights. Yep. I traveled a mm-hmm, ton. Mm-hmm. So we honestly didn't see each other Right, no, exactly. Yeah. And so I, you know, I, I was scared shitless. I was like, fuck, is she going to like me? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we ended up being stronger, uh, which, is, which has been great. Um, now, I, th- I honestly thought by the end – By the time, in October 2020 is when kids were starting to go back to school at New York public schools uh, Mm part-time. And and we elected, we were one of the parents that elected to send our kid to school um, because I had to work and my wife had to work. And it was was fucking hard. It was was miserable. I was blessed too because like, so obviously Volcanic didn't start off with a bang that I wanted. I needed money. I didn't, I, I could quit all my jobs. And then obviously, this is the crazy thing. In March, I'd signed a huge contract for a consulting gig. Mm-hmm. March 3rd. Set me up. Done. Two years. March 17th, contract voided because of COVID. So I had no money. I had no income. Damn. And I was like, fuck, this sucks. <laughs> Isn't that a weird weird place to be like as an adult? Like, like You feel like after so many years, I had, I had a moment like that. Well, my wife was was putting as like in November 2019, I was flown to China mm-hmm. to give a seminar. Like I was saying earlier, yep. I was I was flown to China by the Italian government to speak to Chinese sommeliers about Italian wine as an American. Mm-hmm. April 2020, I was making salads in my friend's restaurant to make money to get by. Yeah, because my friend needed help and I needed money. And he offered me a job. And so, like, I would – so by the – after the first scare and things kind of, like, normalized – I'm doing air quotes yeah, right I now. <laughs> um, you know, restaurants started, like, doing more to-go stuff. They were to-go stuff, yeah. Uh, my friend said, hey, I know you need some help. And this was Billy Durney, who's, who's a, an amazing human being and, and helped me out a lot in my life. Um, he was like, I know you need some help, and I need help. You know, let's let's help each other. And so I would do homeschool during the day, get on my bicycle, ride to Red Hook, and I was Garmanger. I made salads and packed to go orders from April to October 2020, mm. trying to run my company at the same time. 
trying to sell wine and, and it's it's not it, it's a humble it, uh, extremely humbling experience to be on top of the world and, and have that come at your feet and uh i'm still a blessed human being and i've got so many things going for me but it was a it was a giant kick to the nads to uh to be making salads again because that's where i started when i was 18 years old <laughs> But if you had a wedge salad or a kale salad or any ketchup or mustard from Red Hook Tavern between April and October 2020, I'm your guy. There and you I go. put that in the bag. <laughs> we got to turn that into some type of NFT. <laughs> oh my god. Uh and so sales started going I, I you know I was I was blessed. I have great friends, uh, Marquita Levy, who is an amazing human being. Absolutely. Um, she joined my team as a salesperson and started kind of helping me out. And another another guy named Nils Paulson, um, you know, they were commissioned sales reps, and it was tough because, like, you know, we're a new company, and I have these really avant garde like wines and three Chianti Classico, and people are like, "What the fuck are you doing, Jeff? Three Chianti Classico? What's wrong with you?" I was like, "You know, this is a place." Like, you know, 60, 70 years ago, someone was like, "Oh, Burgundy is a place." Maybe eight hundred years ago, I don't know. Well, no, I mean in between the two. I mean, yeah, okay. I mean, okay. So, like, let's unpack that for a second. I mean, yeah, people knew about Burgundy, but like Kermit Lynch said, Burgundy's a place that was like seventy. Like, you know, what I mean, like it right. obviously was there, but then, you know, somebody said, oh, you know, because it was all about Bordeaux, right? It was all about Bordeaux. But like, I've had Lyle on, <laughs> and he's like, you couldn't give Kush away when Kermit was there. Couldn't get this thirty dollars. Who made thirty? I'll take it on uh, close out. <laughs> but that's the thing, right? That is the thing with wine. There's so much wine out there. There's so yeah. much history. There's so much stories, right? Like you were talking about the lack of respect Italian wine gets, and I was thinking, you know, there's a bunch of Spaniards who will fuck you up because Spain gets no respect, right? And then and now, you know, dry Portuguese wines like we we it, it like. It is endless. Like on the one hand, it like that just what you do with the stories, right? Right. There's 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 plenty of people with stories that are not heard in this business. Yeah, they're not being told. And it's it's sad, it's tough, and it's just like the nature of the beast, you know? Like that's the tough thing. Like being being in the wine business in New York City is like you know, London and New York City are the two places in the world where everybody wants to be. Right, because they're 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 international wine cities. Like you know, um, I love California, L.A., but like shit doesn't make it. Everything doesn't make it there. Right. But you know, I mean, it drips and drabs, secondary market. But like shit ends up in London and New York from everywhere. And it's it's uh, it's a congested market. And in in you know, I had producers. It was interesting because like in that time period in, in 2020, people were like, well, why aren't you selling more wine? Why, why aren't you doing a reorder? I was like, bro. I was like, what the <laughs> f <laughs> You don't understand. Like, uh, this book is designed for restaurants. Like, I got to break into retail. Like, restaurants aren't open. There's only one source of, like, an avenue of selling wine. And <clears throat> they don't get it that the entire world, from, from Bordeaux to Uruguay, is trying to sell wine in New York City, and there's 300 distributors here, and they all got a piece of the action, and the 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 the, the wine shop owners were were inundated, and I you know I can't like I like Leon and Sons, Chris Leon, Frankly Wines, Frank's Wine Bar, Popina, uh, Aster Wines and Spirits. Uh, the Union Square Hospitality Group, uh, Crown Shy. I mean, I am blessed by the people that work with my wines. Um, but it it was it was gnarly, and you know, I I tried to reinvent the company a bunch of times, and um, you know, fast forward to 2020, because um, I think we've got another interesting story about this. So, fast forward to today. Right. Um, I don't know if you do this. So today is January 14th. 14th. January 14th. 2022. So um, a decision was made. Uh, so I've splintered off Volcanic Selections. Okay. So Volcanic Selections, I've got some some wines. It's still going to be a very small, intimate import company that I'm looking for, like, people that just want to come to New York may have, like, 
20 cases of wine they want to sell and I can put it to some some people. There, there's some producers like that. They no, have like 20 I, cases right, of right, wine to sell. Right. I, I think that's super cool. Right. It's not necessarily a money maker, but we kind of like move some cool cool shit into New York City. The you know, at the end of the day, my my personal brand has been built about upon Italian wine. So I'd, I'd made Volcanic to kind of be a global thing. I had some other partners, but when the pandemic happened, they had to stay with their normal jobs and I was left alone. Um, and so I created Jeff Porter Selections, which is um, kind of, a, it's focused on family owned run Italian wines. And today, Banville uh, wine merchants pick, pick me up as their, their supplier. Um, so Banville wine merchants will sell my wines from now on. And so I, 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 it provides me logistic support, um, sales support, marketing support instead of being by myself. So you just basically, yeah. So I always wondered how that worked. Um, so basically, you know, it's like Jeff Davies selection. Now you have Jeff, Jeff Porter wines or Jeff Porter selections. You select them, you maintain the relationships, they handle I mean, obviously, you're going to go out in the street and stuff, but, like, basically, they handle all the logistics, getting the shit here, blah, blah, blah. Right. I'm Flavor Flav. Like, oh, you're the hype man. I'm the hype man. I don't mm. have all the talent, but I'm fun. <laughs> I don't know. No that, disrespect. I wouldn't say Flavor Flav. Flav. Actually, I would just say, I, I don't, wouldn't say Flav was necessarily talented, per se. He had, well, he had a skill set. Right. That's what I He am. had a skill set that was applicable to a particular situation and then another one. Which Bridget Nielsen kind of checked out, so you know, there you go. There you go. Uh, I don't have that. <laughs> um, so yeah, as of today, Banville uh, Wine Merchants will be the kind of the I'm like their, their in-house supplier. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I'm super, I'm super excited. Leah Banville, who owns Banville Wine Merchants, I want to get her on here because she's an interesting story in the fact that. Um, she started the company over 25 years ago as a as a woman in in the wine business. It's, it's hard no matter what, and she's Canadian too, like coming in the states and being like, "Hey, here I am." I would de I would definitely love to have her on here because I get her perspective. Because I I went out to dinner uh, with a woman who worked at Wildman, like in the 80s, and I I know it's tough, but like she's like she's like 70 percent of the sales people were women back then because they were women. And they, right. I mean, but yeah. like so it's it's it, I I want these stories to be told because like. I would love to hear how she did that, right? Like, I didn't realize it was a woman on Banville, but I know Banville. That's dope. Yeah. So I'm super excited. So that's the the evolution of Volcanic. So Volcanic still exists. We're this kind of small, nitty-gritty thing that's more kind of maybe like a you want some cool wine in 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 New York. It's, uh, you know, I got you. And then Banville, I'm going to I'm gonna grow that. I've got uh, six other producers coming on board. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's going to be focused solely on Italian wine and kind of sticking with my brand. And so within that, uh, in October of this year, I had an amazing opportunity landing in front of me. Uh, Billy Durney again, who, who, who's like, hey, I was doing a wine dinner. He's like, hey, come come talk, talk to me. He's like, have you heard of the Brooklyn Nets? I was like, I have. <laughs> he said it all down. Shh. They're a basketball team. <laughs> um yeah, uh, Jay Z is a one point blah 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 owner, and uh, they're in Brooklyn. Uh, he's like the owner has, is going to open this cool, dope like wine club in the place he needs a wine person. He's like, I recommended you. He's like, I know them. He's like, I'm like, cool. Tell me more. So he tells me all about this, and then I have like three interviews, and uh, on October fifteenth, I started like doing all the wine programming at Barclays Center. And so I yeah, yeah, he had to cancel. We were supposed to do this shit a couple of days ago. He's like, yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah, the uh, I got you know the owner of the Nets. I got a meeting. Um, I don't get a lot of FaceTime with him. I'm like, all right, man, fuck me. I get it. I would do the same. <laughs> uh, so I uh, so they opened this this uh, restaurant affiliate. Like, uh, so it's the intellectual property, the recipes, the stuff is is, is facilitated by a major food group. Okay. So of Carbone. And uh, the grill and like lobster club and stuff like that. And so I was hired on the 15th of October and the restaurant opened on the 24th of October. So it's the hardest restaurant job I've ever had to do um, by myself. It's been crazy. It's a club. It's, it's, a, it's not a restaurant. So the people there are members. They're the, the season ticket holders. 
Um, it's bit, but it's like what it's the world you actually were in, though, man. It's well. Oh no, yeah, it's, too. It's it's, it's it's still your world. It's, it is the right world. There. Yeah. Um, but the wines we serve are crazy, and we 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 I call it the country club price pricing is that it's only like uh, retail. So whatever we paid for, it's just like a one point five markup. Right. Um, but you're curating it. That's why. Yeah. yeah. So like I have access to the owner's cellar. Um, they they. Uh, they they consign the wine, and then you know I buy from local distributors and stuff like that, and it's it's been crazy. And the cool thing is, so when we first started the club, it was just me and one other sommelier, and the club's too big. It's like you know 180 seats, and mm-hmm. like people are buying wine, and so I pitched them. I was like, hey, why don't we do a why don't we do a, a 1099 contract sommelier kind of gig? So I have 22 sommeliers that are like on a roster, and they pick up shifts. And uh, I have sommeliers, people that work at EMP, people that work at, you know, Carbone, all over the city come and work the Brooklyn Nets games and have fun and work with the clients. And we're, uh, you know, like KD came in last night uh, after the game and he drank 20, 20, this is my favorite thing ever. Like Kevin Durant comes in after the game, you know, it was a tough game. They lost, unfortunately. And uh, he's like, I, I, I need a drink, Jeff. And I was like, okay, cool. So I pour him 2010 Brovia Roca de Cazzalione Barolo. And he's like, what is this? I was like, this is Brovia. He's like, this wine slaps. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, that's awesome. Um, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's fun. It's interesting. And so that's kind of been my, my new gig right now is, is working with them. And, and the, the, the reason I was really interested in the opportunity at the Barclay Center is because wine and sports entertainment irrespective of the nba uh like connection with like lebron and Melo and everybody like jj reddick jj reddick loving the wine and in and like kevin love and all that stuff is that to bring decent wine to normal concessions i've always been kind of like, like this bro, goes back to my marxist bro, socialist kind of like, idea so what's up so like why wouldn't you want to go see Disney on ice and have a cool can of wine? Exactly. You know, why wouldn't you want to go to the Elton John concert and, you know, if you're in the nosebleed, have a nice glass of wine or in the, the floor? Why not? Why, why, why be pressured into having Mayomi at a fucking, like, why have bullshit grocery store wine when, when you can have something good? I want to clap. But I got to buy. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. So that's that's the so the that's the, that's the newest project that I'm working on, is is how do we, in like at at the the Chase Arena in in San Francisco, they've they've started doing some really wine good wine program there. So here on the East Coast, at the Barclay Center, we're working on you know some serious wine programming. Like how do we, how do we bring wine to the people? Like at every level, not just not just luxury. That's because that's not my mo. Like luxury. Luxury is part of what we do. Um, it is a luxury to afford a bottle of wine, but you know, if if you want a, a good glass of wine and you're you're in, you know, you're not in the the lower bowl, you know, you should have that option. It shouldn't just be Budweiser. Yeah, I mean, if you like wine, if you really enjoy wine, what it it, it it's it's it enhances experiences, right? So why not have something that's going like not be like oh, you know, like. There's people like, oh, I like wine, and all they have is yellowtail, so they drink yellowtail. Like, don't do that. Right. Don't do that. Have a Coca-Cola. <laughs> I mean, the, the the thing that – so we started with this Crown Club, so that's the name of the restaurant that MFG kind of helps curate, and I do the wine list for. So we have, like, ridiculous Bordeaux and Burgundy, and it's all well-priced. And then the thing I'm working on all right now is, like, in the suites. And, I, again, that's, again, luxury. But, you know, right now you can get, like – I don't know, Mayomi, and it's it's like why? Like you can go to uh, uh, your bodega and get Mayomi. Uh, you can go anywhere, and, and so get we're gonna provide, you know, wines of substance, wines of thought, and then also on top of that, have a reserve list because we have that ability with a Crown Club. You want to pre-order ninety six, um, you know, you know, Leville Lacoste. We got it. Why not? Right. Why not? If you're going to spend X, Y, Z money to have a suite, why not have something awesome? Seriously. Seriously. So 
th- that's this opportunity for me and my part of my career. I was like, wow, this is like sports and everything. This is a big deal. This is like, how can we kind of turn the volume up for wine for everybody? And the cool thing about Brooklyn is the thing that I love. Like last night, I was walking through the Crown Club. Is this, it's not just filled with a bunch of white people. <laughs> it's not. It's not like Brooklyn. Brooklyn, it like, and the the other cool thing about it is our sommelier staff is diverse. There are more women, more people of color, than there are just a bunch of you know white guys like me. You know, I I I, I own it. I am what I am. I can't change that. Yeah, don't ever. But don't ever not own that. But uh, we uh, it's it's the it's it's there's a conscious thing of, of ensuring that Brooklyn exists within Brooklyn. Well, and there's gonna, so much change. Yeah, right. I was going to say, but, so that's really cool because, you know, essentially, even though a lot of change, my roommate from law school was from Fort Greene. It's way different from when I used to go hang out with him in the projects. We were in law school mm-hmm. in the mid-90s. Stop and frisk. <laughs> um, Coming back. But um, it seems that I, I think wine has done a good job. I think wine is been pretty representative of the united states even throughout history i mean it's small people there's a small percentage of people different peoples here it isn't we are in a mostly white country um and now i think it especially it's you know there's you're seeing more and more right um and brooklyn brooklyn you know we just got to keep brooklyn brooklyn brooklyn, brooklyn is the brooklyn, borough man yeah. you know never taking shorts because brooklyn is the borough right like it, you, you amen i mean like the the you know, the ownership, Joe Tsai, who's the owner of the, the Nets, you know, Taiwanese Canadian, uh, made made his his fortune with Alibaba in China, uh, came back. He and his wife, Claire Tsai, are super focused on, you know, equity uh, amongst the the black community and the Asian community. And they've done a lot specific because they took over at the like end of. 2019 Mm -hmm. so they wrote out all of 2020 all of 2021 uh and they've been a part of it like you know claire Sai and meek mills have you know they're like they have a foundation uh working on um you know uh social justice and specifically uh uh, reform within incarceration Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they 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 are putting their money where their mouth is and i think that's that's a really important thing for brooklyn um, because, you know, there's this thing, the skies of Brooklyn, like, you know, all these, these, these mega buildings are going up because it's the land that's available. Like Manhattan, the land's not available anymore. So you got to go somewhere else. Right. You know, I remember Long Island city is like, is like blowing up, but the, the, uh, what they're doing and, and, and what the players are interested in doing within Brooklyn is is pretty special, and I, I'm excited to be just on the fringe of it because I'm on this like little part where, you know, wine is the thing. But they're like, when I talk about like, hey, we can do, we want to introduce wine to more people, and that's like kind of this concessions thing, and like not still make it, you know, it's not a ten times markup, right? You know, yeah. that's what we're working on right now for next season, and. You know, that's what I'm excited about is how do we bring more wine to the people? It's it's about that really delicious canned wine, not necessarily that bo- bottle of DRC. Jeff Porter, thanks for coming back, man, and bringing it full circle to where you are now. I'm excited to see what you're doing, and uh, I'm excited for our mandate. <laughs> and, just, and, and just hang with you, brother. I mean, um, you're a really good guy. Thanks, man. I appreciate um, it. This was um, fun. And uh, – Shit, man. Tell everybody where they can find you. You can find me uh, at Jeff Porter Wines on Instagram. Uh, I'm working on a TikTok thing, so watch out. Uh oh. I bet his TikTok is going to be dope. Um, Everybody, yo, it is your boy, MJ. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, And, uh, you know, what we're going to do is keep doing this thing in 2022. Um, I got one more person coming in for season. Let me see. This would be season three. Yeah, season three. Then we're going to start season four before the end of the month. So, everybody, um, thank you so much for listening. Until next time, to all you mavericks, to all you philosophers, to you deep thinkers, and you wine drinkers, peace. <laughs>